And welcome back, everyone, to our regionals in Bochum, Germany. We just had an exciting round two. Um, you're back here again with me, Alex Dow, alongside Amy, of course. Um, interesting match. You had a great chance to speak to Owen as well. Honestly, they're a delight. It was fantastic. <laughs> the match was riveting. I was watching the entire time. The commentary, of course, on point. Oh. So it was just a beauty to watch. I'm so thrilled to be able to bring another match that looks really interesting back onto the camera again. Yeah, we've got two fantastic players lined up for our round three. Um, we, will, we will have Miloslav uh, playing a loss box deck up against Seb Simmons, who's going to be bringing a little bit of spice in his Lugia list. <laughs> um, I've seen him play it before, um, but it's uh, just a little bit of a a lot of intrigue actually from us and for the viewers at home, but it'll be another fantastic matchup uh, which we're going to be bringing to you shortly. Um, but just for the moment, you know, we've seen a few decks so far. Um, we've seen Mew now winning the last round against Lugia, already had a little bit of spice with the cancelling Cologne. Um, so we're just going to see other little variants, which is what we spoke about when we first started the show. Yeah, there are so many different techs that you can pop into these decks. It really does completely transform them. Yeah. They're not quite as linear as maybe some of the meta would like us to believe, because every deck, even a few cards difference, can change entirely what your play against each matchup is and how you pace yourself in the game. Yeah, exactly. Each player is looking for those small percentage points to try and give them that slight advantage in different matchups. Um, um, that cancelling cologne offering that opportunity as an out to stuff like that Aerodactyl, um, which is fantastic to see come to fruition. Obviously, it was a very back and forth matchup. Um, and here, like I said, we're going to see Lost Box again. Again, it's going to have very sort of special techs, special cards that um, Miloslav's chosen to go ahead with. Um, but again, like, like I just mentioned, Seb with this uh, very intriguing deck, and we'll go to it shortly, of course. We'll see once they begin uh, setting up. Um, for you guys and just kind of give you a bit of insight, but we're gonna we're gonna keep building it up because it's such a cool card to be including. Honestly, you guys are not gonna want to miss <laughs> this match. Don't go anywhere because it's going to go down. These two decks are prime examples of two titans going against one another. Mm -hmm. They really are just quite special. Yeah, definitely. And then we'll just go to our players setting up now. Uh, we have Seb on our left-hand side with his very unique hairstyle. Love talking to Seb about how he kind of brings his own little vibe um, to these streams as well. And Milosov on the right-hand side. Both players, um, not, you know, they've been on stream before. Um, they've been fantastic players who've done super well before, um, making day two at Worlds on a regular basis. Uh, Seb has been a regional champion um, back in the UK. I believe it was Sheffield Regionals that he um, was able to take down. And Miloslav's always been one of those players who have been here, there, and about the top players uh, for quite some time now. Um, and as you can see, the confirmation of both players' decks there as well. It's so great to see these two back again. And like we just said, with some really interesting deck lists, I think this is going to be a really fun match. I'm really excited to see how it goes down. I really hope both decks perform in the way that these guys, these guys have planned as well. And just, I, I, it's unimaginable to believe that either of them could kind of have any flaw in their game plan. They just have everything worked out plenty ahead of time. It's whether they see each other coming. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, both players have mentioned they're seasoned players. They won't know, of course, what little tech cards that each player will be playing. Um, just to give you a little bit of insight, Miroslav, you know, he's playing that Lost Box deck. It won't be too dissimilar to what we saw uh, in round one with Pedro. Um, he is also playing that wonderful Zamazenta card that we introduced a little bit earlier. Um, also playing that Thumping Snor uh, Thumping Snor <laughs> yeah, Snorlax. Um, uh, also as well, because it's such a powerful card, big HP, big attacker, um, and also playing those um, combo cards, which is like Raikou Vs, the Luminians, the, the Drapion V as well. Um, so lots of little cards that we typically would expect. Um, some of the counts might be a little bit different, but you know, this is... Where are we moving towards now? That Zamazenta, we're seeing a lot of top players picking up as their tech card of choice. Yeah, it's a fantastic addition to the deck, and I think one of the main ones that came out of Crown Zenith as well. So it's one of the cards to really look out for. I think most season players have picked up that Zamazenta now, mm -hmm. and it's going to be really interesting to see how mm. exactly <laughs> Seb is choosing to deal with it. And a little hint there in the prize <laughs> 
Yeah, definitely. There's that little ditto V there, sat in Seb's side of the board. Um, both players there just opening probably with arguably their ideal starters at this current point. Does look like Middlesoft is kicking us off for our round three of Bochum Regionals there with the battle VIP pass. Um, but yeah, just from Seb's side of the board, we'll give you a little hint now. It's a lovely little Pokemon that has a massive VMAX and will take extra prizes. Not quite the Stoutland that you typically would see uh, to be no. able to do so. Um, but it's another unique card, Amy, it's isn't it? Absolutely. Still a lovely normal type. <laughs> I wonder what we could be bringing. But honestly, Melissa looks like they've got off to a really slamming start here, bringing down that Greninja and another Comfey. Hopefully this Lost Zone engine can get going. Yeah, and I think Millisar just double-checking his prizes as well. We're just having a quick look ourselves, nothing too crazy. We're seeing the little flavors of energy, you know, that metal and water both there in the prizes. Um, only one of the battle VIP passes, that Cramorant, um, which, you know, typically a lot of these lists play two ofs. Um, so nothing too crazy uh, at this current moment in time. Maybe that one boss could come into effect a little bit later. Um, but often with Lost Box, sometimes you like to try and deal what's in front with what's in front of you anyway. So uh, Milosaf now um, being able to have all that knowledge, having had his first deck search, uh, Seb looks like he's just playing out his hand, just making sure he also knows um, what he's expecting to be doing on his when it comes to his turn as well. Um, but we're going to be expecting more from Milosaf here, um, as with most Lo Lost Box decks. Yeah, it's interesting with Lost Box decks because you do have to manage your time very well. We've only got 50 minutes to play up to three games. So they either need to cinch that win early on a game one or have enough time to be able to play out some more. Yeah, definitely. And there's the first concealed cards. Um, and I believe this might be the first flower selecting. It looks like he's just kept hold of a Pokemon there. Um, unfortunately, we do not get to see what exactly was uh, pushed over to the Lost Zone, but that will be one into the count. There is a scoop up net. Uh, one of those wonderful pivot option cards. Um, and there's the second. Yeah, Milosov just giving us a bit of an indication that he is using another flower selecting there as well, just for the viewers at home and us to follow as well as we can. Yeah, it's also just going through his massive hand there, <laughs> straight back down to another convey. It's really typical of a Lost Box player, isn't it? It's a really obvious sign of what a deck is, just that how many cards are in that hand. Mm. And there's a capture energy as well, giving a lot of utility options. You know, this is only turn one, uh, don't forget. Um, and as you can see, turn one of a Lost Box deck, we're already sort of four minutes in, um, and it's just going to be continuing to power through. Does eye up that Manaphy with that wonderful ability to stop damage um, being done to the bench uh, of Miloslav, of course, wanting to limit the options of uh, Seb taking multiple prizes. Um. Yeah, I think one of the really <laughs> scary parts of a Lugia deck can be that Raikou who can just pop out of nowhere. Mm. So getting that Manaphy down nice and early can be really beneficial, but too early and it can definitely be swung to the active. So it's a bit of a risk versus reward play, but hopefully Miloslav will find it useful. But uh, this is where Milosav is going to start trying to eventually work out what Seb's playing in his version of his list. Uh, we mentioned that amazing rare Raikou there that typically would deal uh, damage to the bench as well. Um, but, you know, Ma just having that Manaphy there, because he has access to cards like Scoop Up Net, um, it's not too much of an issue, too much of a hindrance on, on that bench sort of management. Um, as Milosav also does get down that Zamazenta, um, threatening that Retaliate attack, um, dealing plenty of damage should a KO be taken from Seb's turn. Yeah, it's nice to see some peace of mind right on the bench <laughs> straight away. And look, look at how much there's in the discard pile on the Lost Zone already. You can certainly tell that this is a very typical Lost Zone turn one. Uh, no Cramorant to be seen yet because we can't use it yet. So it's interesting because the deck works really well if you go first or second. Yep. Arguably, either are great. So you can just make it work to your advantage no matter what. But taking turn the first turn away from your opponent could almost be just as fantastic for you. Yeah, definitely. And it does just pass over to Seb after a bench of the Cramorant. So Miroslav does have his attackers sort of primed and ready. There's three in a lost zone will likely get the fourth, um, very highly likely get the fourth, and then begin to start swinging away. Of course, with Seb playing Lugia, um, typically they don't get too many options to sort of really deal damage or take prizes early on. Um, but here we go with Seb with an Ultra Ball discarding one of those uh, choices uh, that we typically do start to see now in a lot of Lugia lists, that Raikou V. 
um, and one of those Aurora energies has hit the discard as well. Um, Seb now just double checking his options that are available to him. Um, as you can see, he's probably starting to pull out which cards he will be needing uh, in this matchup, knowing he is going to be facing down against some very small, basic Pokemon um, on Minasav's um, side of the board. So um, he's just going to be double checking what's available to himself, of course. Yes, yeah, that's going to be need to be taking a lot of prize cards unless he might have something else up his sleeve. I mean, we're all expecting <laughs> it to come out now, but um, <laughs> we're just going to keep teasing our way through this matchup. <laughs> I think seems. we've given a lot of hints <laughs> at this point, but getting yeah, getting rid of that right. It's not really needed in this matchup, and um, it's not going to be in any of the future games. It certainly can take a knockout. It might be mm -hmm. nice to end the game with the Lost Box typically having a really big bench, mm -hmm. powering up that Raikuna quite nicely. But right now, it's not the most important thing, but a very notable card, which is interesting to see in Lugia List because it's not super typical of them all the time. No, definitely not. But um, yeah, just grabs the Archeop. So obviously, with this whole engine of Lugia and that wonderful V-Star ability that it has, being able to put um, colorless uh, Pokemon from the discard pile onto the bench, you know, those, this is the game plan of being able to hopefully find a way to discard that Archeops now into the discard as well. Um, and then just start maybe using things like Read the Wind, pull more cards into his hand for the time being. Uh, and just begin setting up. Because you're Lugia, you're always a little bit on the back foot. But at the same time, Miloslav's side will only be dealing sort of finite amounts of damage. Um, and there we do see a Serena discarding our Archeops and drawing up to five cards in his hand. A Lugia's dream is to get those Archeops <laughs> in the bin on the first turn. It's just beautiful to see. Hopefully Seb's got it and they'll be able to run away with this. Lugia is just so fast when it gets set up and ready to go. The pace is unbelievable. Um, it's unusual when a Lugia player has to deal with only having one Archeops. So Seb will be thinking long and hard about the next few turns. But two Lugia makes them safe to move on to Milislav's turn. Yeah, and that was just a read the wind discarding, I believe, that uh, dark hiding energy. Um, just being able to draw an additional three cards as we move back over to Milislav, kicking things off with a chorus experiment. This is where we're talking about all those micro decisions now, bouncing between comfies, finding uh, the opportunities to get the right cards into the Lost Zone so he can activate all of those special cards that he'll be playing um, as well. Um, that we also saw Pedro playing earlier. So all of those access to Mirage Gates, access to Sableye. Um, so it'll be interesting to see how Mirosav is able to navigate this turn um, and see whether which direction he goes in in terms of how he might start applying some pressure to Seb's board as we see the first flower selecting of his turn two. Miloslav's put Seb in a really interesting position because they've already put that pressure on a little bit. Mm. There's three attackers on that bench. That's not very typical of an early Lost Box game. But Seb hasn't quite given away the ghost yet of what right. exactly is going on in his spicy deck. So it'll be interesting to see this kind of intimidating stance from Miloslav's deck against a very typical early game Lukia play. Mm. Yeah. Really interesting stuff. Some real power play of intelligence against these two players. Yeah, definitely. And as I said, we'll, we're just going to keep teasing. We're, I'm expecting Seb to eventually pull it out of the bag at some stage. Um, but just for the time being, you know, this is what you'd expect of a Lugia deck turn one. Uh, particularly if you go second, yeah, <laughs> just the easy swap round of the DTE there, just so players know for their escape rope play, um, because it's just the two Lugias that are available on Seb's side of the board. Um, whilst Milosav is still, again, just pivoting around, using plenty of flower selecting, um, bumping up those lost zone numbers, and just having a plethora of options in his hand. So we're just waiting to see how Milosav's going to play this out um, to the maximum effect that he can, just applying all of that pressure. I love the juxtaposition of the beautiful flowers floating <laughs> around, and yet Milislav's crafting the most devious hand. <laughs> yeah. This is stuff that Seb has to stare down at this whole time, just whilst he's waiting. All he's really done is an attach uh, energy and just drawn some cards. You know, in comparison, Milislav is just, you know, everything's going on. You've got both the flower selectings on the board already turned to the left. And we hit that seven in the loss zone. Yep, That's what we're go. talking about. <laughs> And there's a switch card in hand as well. There's some more pivoting going on. But uh, 
yeah, it is definitely something uh, what we'd like to see is, again, applying some pressure now. So you're going to start putting damage onto the board, onto Seb's side. Um, Milosav, again, will have to start thinking about, and I'm going to keep alluding to this, particularly with Lost Box decks, you have to start prize mapping exactly where you're going to be taking all six. Uh, and in this scenario, with options like being able to apply pressure and damage to Lugias, which typically can't, again, be uh, healed or sort of removed from play, um, this is where just Milosar's game plan is just to keep putting so much pressure on Seb's side of the board and then start taking larger knockouts when the opportunity presents itself. Um, but we do see that spit innocently uh, from the Cramorant there with 110 damage onto the Lugia V. It's so fantastic that that's just a free attacker for any Lost Zone component. It's a beautiful card. Only four cards need to be in the Lost Zone, and you just get to use an attack for free for 110. It allows Milislav to have the momentum build. Yeah, I mean, here we go. That's a, a massive card here for Seb. He will need uh, another Archeops into the discard, and there it is. Uh, instant pick from that Evo Incense uh, being played down, so that Archeops will go to a hand, um, and it'll be on Seb to see if he can pull out that Lugia V-Star um, so he can start again building up his board, applying pressure from his way by taking potentially the first prize using that Summoning Star ability. Um, and put two colorless Pokemon onto his bench and eyeing up those Archeops already to start accelerating energy where possible. And that's where Lugia really runs away with it, right? But they both have really strong energy engines, so it's going to be interesting to see which one can keep up with the whole place of play where the prize cards could go in either direction. So getting an evolution as well as an evolution Pokemon in Archeops this turn for Seb is essential. Attaching another energy to that bench Lugia V, hoping that that's going to be our attacker this turn by the looks of it. Hope he, hopefully we'll be able to get the pivot back onto the bench with the damaged one. Will he evolve it? Will he not? We'll find out. Yeah, there's a few different options. I guess he's gone for the Oranguru from that capture energy. Maybe he potentially has a card which he doesn't want to discard, maybe. Um, so he wants to save it for a later turn. Um, there's the Oranguru being played. And of course, he still does have the Archeops, does have the V-Star in hand now. Um, so he will be able to use that Summoning Star ability in due course. Um, but now it's just trying to figure out how else he can play out this turn because he still does need that half second Archeops in the discard at the moment. Um, working with just one Archeops just means um, there's just too much available. I guess maybe it was the energies that was in his hand. A um, tough decision. Yeah, but a tough decision, but one of those that just has to happen, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe that was what the Guru play was, trying to save some of that energy, that precious energy in this matchup. And he's probably very aware that there's already two energy in those prize cards. So having to get rid of some others early game can be really risky. Yeah, definitely. And there it is. There's that V-Star being turned over. The two Archeops are now available for Seb to start attaching those energies from his uh, deck itself. So he can allow, he can choose two any two special energies uh, within his deck and attach them to one of his Pokemon. So he's got an attacker in the active position. Of course, it is damaged, which is not ideal. He does choose to use one of his Archeops um, abilities right now. Um, as he goes through his deck, again, as you mentioned, there is a finite amount of energies that are typically available in, in Lugia decks. Um, does just go for the one capture energy from the first Archeops. Um, just goes for, it looks like another capture energy, probably just kind of confirming where exactly he's going to be attaching that with that Primal Turbo ability. Mm, looks like this could be another Read the Wind turn. We could be just getting that Lugia ready. Unless he does have some sort of pivot in hand, but usually you might see sort of a double turbo energy attached there for a manual retreat, mm -hmm. but with a limited resource that is energy uh, in this game. <gasps> and there it is. There There's, it is. There's, there's our little lord. <laughs> we've, been <te> <laughs> we've been teasing him or her um, this whole time, but we do now finally see um, a Greedent Fee come down. Um, and as, all, as everyone or a lot of people will know, you can evolve it to a V Max, which has a an amazing attack for just double colors, which is turn the profit for 30 damage. If your opponent's basic Pokemon is knocked out by damage from this attack, you take two more prize cards. So imagine Stoutland with far more HP yeah. and being able to take 
another prize on top of already um, to dip the fangs. Greedent's a big, cuddly guy, <laughs> but he doesn't mess around when it comes to little dudes with not a lot of HP. So with some powerful energies loaded onto that attack, it only costs two energy. So they can double turbo, but obviously it would take it down to a 10 damage attack. So not ideal. Ideally, it's two double turbos on there at least. And then targeting down those single prizes. Yeah, you want to be using those powerful energies to ramp up that damage and so we can stretch high and far and wide to take free prizes every time it's taken a knockout. Oh. Um, but as Seb is just now playing, he's playing the long game it seems. He has just read the, wee, uh, read the wind um, once again. Uh, again, increasing at hand, making sure he's ready for his own combo pieces. Um, there is that escape rope play by Miloslav, um, and Seb has decided to promote that Oranguru. Maybe a little bit less useful right now, but as long as he has a way to retreat back out of it, uh, not a problem at all as Miloslav is going straight into those confis again and now eyeing down. He did pick up that Greedent V, uh, reminding himself, of course, exactly what he's going to be facing up against shortly. Um, I'm but sure he's not unawares of that bigger <laughs> attack on the VMAX, and it's quite scary to see all these other attackers lined up on Seb's side of the board. He seems to have turned the tides, playing yep. him at his own game here with some really intimidating Pokemon almost ready to rumble. Yeah, and it's one of those things where, you know, the Green and V is something that could be potentially knocked out um, early um, if he's found... If Miloslav is able to find a way maybe into something like the Snorlax and the Choice Belt, um, should something like that be played. Um, but typically, if it's unable to be dealt with, Seb's next turn will be focusing to try and evolve that up up to that 320 v max, uh, HP V max as soon as possible. Um, so Miloslav will be just eyeing up different routes right now to victory where he can, um, as we see a chorus experiment hit the, hit the field. Um, again, all of those micro decisions coming out to play. Uh, plenty of cards into the Lost Zone um, as we're going into it now as well. But, you know, that Greedent will be threatening uh, Miloslav's board for quite some time if he's unable to deal with it. Yeah, it's got huge HP too, so Lost Box is going to really struggle to hit those big numbers if they manage to evolve it. So it's going to, only time will tell really, because it could really change the pace of the game entirely. Taking three prize cards on a single prizer. That only takes two chomps of a big VMAX to call the game over. No, exactly that. Um, because typically we do see, you know, Stoutland V, it's got 210 HP as well, using the, the, its attack to be able to take an additional prize. Um, again, being powered up by uh, the, the Archeops' ability, the Primal Turbo, to apply those powerful energies so it can breach those extra damage as well. But knowing that the Greedent VMAX could potentially take two prizes back to back because it can take a hit um, is something that not a lot of players necessarily look at or see is likely to happen uh, in a matchup. So Mirosov may not be used to kind of seeing a Greedent V or Greedent VMAX on the board um, at any stage, uh, typically just expecting a, a Stoutland. Oh, an interesting attached to a comfy there. Maybe ready for a retreat cost later. I can't imagine he'd be wanting to use its attack. But you <laughs> never know. No, it looks like it's going to be another spit innocently onto that Oranguru, kind of trying to keep it active, trap it a little bit. But it's also just 10 HP um, damage away from being knocked out. Of course, does have access to that sprinkle uh, from Sableye uh, with that Lost Mine attack later as well. So kind of just, again, setting up that board, looking for those opportunities to really um, put himself in a great position. As we do see now, it goes over to Seb, and there's the instant VMAX evolution um, as we're about to see how Seb is going to navigate this turn. Of course, that Cramorant does have 110 HP, so is a bit of a stretch right now um, to necessarily find a way to use... Uh, Greed and VMAX to take a knockout there. He will be eyeing up those little mons with just 70 HP. That Manaphy looks uh, like a nice little target and also those Confis as well. Um, as you can see there, the first Primal Turbo is eyeing up using those Archeops as um, extra single prize attackers as well to kind of keep himself in that, in that vein of single prize uh, matchups. Um, and we'll just kind of see another Evo incense. So Seb, again, just thinning that deck, making sure he's left with just good cards left um, as well. It's interesting to know that Archeops is a good attacker too. Archeops can put in some work. Doing 120 damage itself, that's going to take out that Cramorant nice and easy. So it's a really fantastic attacker in a single prize matchup where they're probably going to have to take a return KO. 
on a single prizer. The only risky part, I suppose, looks like possibly, like you say, a Sableye or a Greninja. Because Greninja could quite comfy take out the Oranguru and possibly the Lugia on bench as well. Yeah, um, we'll put a lot of damage onto that Lugia um, because it's got 110 already. Mm. Um, so, and potentially another 19, maybe putting it up to the 200, but yeah. again, just reduces the amount that he needs to sprinkle later uh, exactly. with the Sableye. So, lots of different utility routes to kind of victory here. Um, Seb using his um, Oranguru there to put another card back to the top of the deck, shuffle it back in, um, and now, of course, using. Uh, the second Archeops' Primal Turbo. Looks like some powerful energy has been targeted down. Will it go? Of course, double, t <laughs> double powerful energy onto the Green and VMAX now doing a base 70 damage. Yeah, um, perfect yeah. amount, especially considering we knew that one has already hit the discard pile mm. and the other's in the prize card, so two was all it took. Yeah, and uh, I guess Seb is just going to be eyeing up where he can make this play uh, potentially. Of course, at the moment, still has that Oranguru in the active spot. Um, as you've already uh, highlighted a moment ago as well, there's not typically with Lugulus, there's not too many switching um, opportunities or outs uh, within the deck itself. Um, but of course, with a Pokemon like Greed and VMAX being able to take so many prizes in one go, he can still take his time um, at this point. Yes, Milosav can apply a lot of pressure um, the way he has done by putting damage on both the Lugia and the Oranguru already. But there's a lot of different ways. And evolving up Ooh. as well gives now Lugia an extra 170 HP, I believe, left uh, still to be knocked out. So kind of keeps it things out of range. There's the manual attachment and there's the Sycamore. Well, Sycamore, sorry. Professor's Research, sorry. Very used to older cards, which did with the same effect. Um, but yeah, just nicely removing the Drapion V out of his deck as well. We've got a lot of professors now. <laughs> it's very true, very true. There's so many different variants. Same with the bosses. It's interesting to see which each player picks, really. <laughs> it's just kind of pick your favorite. I like that we have that diversity in just deck design as well. Yeah, 100%. I think it's kind of keeps everyone involved throughout the generations that's seen different professors as well. And they've seen that they're also all involved in the game in some way, shape or form. Uh, so Seb's just eyeing up what's available to him. I believe it might be potentially, not too sure what he can really do here. Uh, with the 110 HP Cramoran in the active spot, we'll likely maybe try and knock it out with the Archeops. You've done your job, Archeops, now. Archeops um, has certainly served his purpose. Yeah. One Archeops is plenty from here on out. Greedent's ready. Lugia's almost ready. Even the damaged Lugia has a little energy on. Mm. So one Archeops might be enough here. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's already nine, looks like nine energies on board. Um, we've seen a number already hit the discard as well, but does Seb really need many more beyond this? Obviously, that Lugia might need an extra attachment if it does need to be an attacker at some stage. Um, but it just will be you know, up for Milosov to see how he can maneuver here in this position. Yeah, he passes the turn, leaves the Guru in the active. Yeah, I and mean, that's... This kind of forces Milosav to also find a way maybe to also pick up a Pokemon. Um, so Milosav may look to try and limit those opportunities of that Greedent uh, being able to take so many prizes um, by removing the smaller HP Pokemon where possible. Um, that's why Seb also has other attackers on his board at the same time. So you can see both players having to try and uh, adapt and react to each other's game plan here as Milosav is playing at Mirage Gate. Just eyeing up which flavors of energy he's going to be attaching um, to his board. Looks like he's pulled out a lightning energy and a metal energy, of course. That Zamazenta being able to deal a high amount of damage once a Pokemon does get knocked out. Typically enough, as I kind of mentioned before, for the Stoutland. Um, yeah. But yeah, a bit out of reach for the uh, Greed and VMAX. Yeah, unfortunately so, because they managed to evolve it, of course. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the risk of playing Greed and why possibly a lot of players have avoided it is that managing to evolve it without it getting knocked out before then can be a little bit scary and without Stoutland. Yeah, exactly that. And because there's no choice belt in Miloslav's list, um, the only way to reach those 210, 220 HP Pokemon is if a Pokemon does get knocked out. So maybe that's something Seb would very quickly or early identify that. If I just don't take a knockout here, there's no real way to be retaliated uh, from that Zamazenta, which means that Greed and V would generally be able to survive and not more um, attacks. So it does just look like a pass back over um, from Minnesota. Doesn't really want to give up too much 
right now. Doesn't want to uh, wants to force Seb to have to manually um, retreat, um, and of course, kind of utilize and maximize the value of the damage counters on it. It's really curious because they've both passed the turn without taking a knockout. Mm. Nobody has taken a single prize mm -hmm. card, and yet they've both got each other on the ropes. Yeah, and they, we're almost we're just about halfway into the round right now. It looks like. Seb's going to get some more utility out of the Oranguru before anything does happen to it. Um, of course, does have, does have the retreat option now. We'll be looking for those um, bosses uh, where possible, but does play the Marnie, looking to disrupt the hand of Minasov. This is what we wanted to see a number of times um, in the first round as well, where Lost Box is just building a massive hand, a lot of combo cards. Um, and it's just a scenario where now Seb is put in a position where will he be the person who will take an initial knockout, potentially get retaliated from that Zamazenta. Uh, and yet again, it's all about this prize mapping. Uh, Seb's going to have to do it as well. It's interesting because from a Lost Box perspective, as you go through the game, you tend to have less card draw mm. because you're, you've used up those resources that let you pivot between the comp phase. The only thing you've got left is that concealed cards from Greninja letting you discard one card to draw two, but are you going to discard too many? Are you going to thin your resources too finely? Can you get them back in time? There's so many questions, and it's such a skillful act to watch it be played flawlessly. Yeah, resource management has been uh, such a highly skilled aspect of the game, uh, with a lot of players having to manage that, of course, you have sometimes have a couple of get out of jail cards with uh, the ordinary rods or other previous cards like super rods or res energy recycler and things like that or Clara. Um, but you know, energy re uh, sorry, resource management is just uh, such an important feat of most decks, even more so with Lost Box. You have it on the Lugia side as well, your energies uh, and in terms of your board state. <laughs> and a number of other things like that. But Lost Box is always about it, um, particularly with those energy counts. It's the different uh, board management, it's the different attackers, the Lost Zone engine. What have you put into there? What have you discarded? Um, as you can see, just another, again, this is the third Chorus's experiment from Miroslav. And it's just another, you know, very difficult number of decisions that he has to make. Um, yeah, yeah, there's a lot in the Lost Zone right now, and you can't get those cards back, so they are stuck there. 12 cards of the 60-card deck stuck over in the Lost Zone until the next match. Yeah, it's, a, it's an incredible engine, um, particular way that it's, it all sort of marries up together with the Chorus's experiment, with all the uh, Conface file selections and the different unique abilities and attackers that utilize it. Um, it's such a, a great concept to see back in the game. Of course, we've had it for some time now. Um, so, yeah, it's just interesting to see how both players having a bit of a standoff right now. As you mentioned, yeah. no prizes taken. Almost 30 minutes in um, into this long game one. Um, and we do see the scoop up net. So this is where I mentioned he's also managing those resources. We've seen already at least one played, um, but knowing those scoop up nets are vital for you to protect your Pokemon on your bench because that Greedent is just staring you down, ready to start swinging for 70 damage. And there are um, three cards on <laughs> Miller's Love's bench and that Greedent is ready to gnaw. Yeah. Like, that, they, <laughs> they could be gone. So it's, it's really tough to make sure that they're protected in the way that Miller's Love wants right now. And he is really trying to make that decision. Yeah, so Oh, going just, for the cram. Yeah, I'm just looking for those pivot options and just seeing <laughs> he's, he's just got to double check what, how many more does he have access to? How many is he uh, lost zone? How many is in his discard pile? Yeah. This is vital for him to be able to potentially just get them off the board and it does go for the cram yeah. rant. We'll need to keep uh, maybe getting cards into his hand and just kind of plowing through to his deck as well so that he can get the right attackers out at the right time. Um, as we do see the first flower selecting before the attachment, um, giving himself as much information before he makes a play he obviously would not be able to take back. Um, so does have an option here um, of the flower selecting. Again, turning it to the left. It's not asleep, just so everyone knows. It <laughs> is just the fact that he's used um, the ability. I wonder whether Seb thinks that they are in the domineering position here with Miller's love. Not struggling to keep up a board, but obviously with Seb's absolute defiance to knock anything out, Miller's Love's like, oh, goodness, my plan of that Zamazenta isn't going too pretty right now. 
Yeah, and we do see the slam down Sableye come down as well. It does have 10 extra HP over some of the smaller Mons um, that is on Middle East Slav's board. Um, but of course, does have that special Lost Mine attack. Uh, being able to only use it once you have 10 or more cards in the Lost Zone, but you are allowed to put 12 damage counters on your opponent's Pokemon in any way you like. So this might be one way for Millisav to start prepping um, that Greedent VMAX to be able to be return KO'd. Um, again, it's all about this prize mapping. You've got to figure out how you're going to take this prize now or take a prize later, which turns you're going to be taking a prize on. Can you put it into range so that Zamazenta could come in swinging um, and knock it out um, on a retaliate attack at a later turn as well? And there's um, a lovely gold training court that comes down. Another energy goes back to Mirosav's hand, and now it's on Mirosav to start thinking about where he's going to be placing these damage counters. I think from Mirosav's perspective, that Greedent's still a threat. They, of course, don't know that that final powerful energy is in the prize cards. They might be thinking Seb is holding that back just in case they don't need it on the Greedent in the end because there would be no point in putting it on too early because it could end up being a bit not very useful, really. <laughs> yeah. if, if you're only taking Comfies, you didn't need that third powerful energy. The attack only costs two. So putting the minimum on for now and then upping that damage seems like a good use of their own resources. So that Sableye is quite a bold move. I feel like it's quite terrifying to put him up there now. No, it's, I completely agree, because it's still quite a, quite a small little Mon that can take a lot of damage quite quickly. But I really like the play from Minoslav here, um, setting up the Greedent VMAX in range for the Zamazenta um, on a Retaliate turn, because dealing 100 to it now brings it down to the 220. Um, that is perfect numbers for the Zamazenta to come in swinging should a Pokemon be knocked out. Um, and also just kind of then puts himself in a bit of a dominating position. I think Seb would have wanted to have seen a boss's um, order a lot earlier. Um, of course, had to, I believe, discard that Lumi one of his Luminions earlier, but at the same time, his board was quite um, already quite set up and quite full. But because he didn't see those boss orders, wasn't able to sort of retreat into the Greedent and take maybe a knockout um, early on uh, before it took some damage. Um, he might be a little bit on the back foot here, um, but that standoff provided Milosov with that opportunity. Um, and as you can see here, we do see that boss's orders onto the convey mm. um, with that attachment there. And we, do, we are likely to see here that turn of profit attack, um, currently doing 70 damage, but we'll be able to take three prizes. There it is. <laughs> so um, this does put him in, a, in the lead right now. That Zamazenta is instantly promoted, knowing he will be able to retaliate for 220 damage mm. and take three prizes himself. Three for three. They're keeping pace. These decks seem pretty evenly matched right now. It'll be interesting to see. There's a lot of damage on Seb's board. Will it matter? Are those save lives going to do their, all of their fantastic maths right and get those knockouts it's such a difficult deck to pioneer yeah no definitely and it's again from Seb's side it's going to be a little bit difficult because of all that damage that's available um, to be ramping up from Millisar's side anyway and just knowing he's going to be able to just take three more knockouts or three more prizes I'd say so potentially two knock two knockouts that Oranguru looks like an easy target with just 10 HP and we do say Bye bye um, to the knocked out Greedent VMAX, um, which obviously has put in a lot of work. Um, Seb currently is in, I guess, if he does take the knockout here, in a pit, in a more better position just based on prizes alone. But from a board state perspective, Milislav is. Uh, I wouldn't be, wouldn't be too sad in Milosov's position right now. No, there's a lot of damage on the board still on Seb's side. That Oranguru is clutching on. Mm -hmm. uh, Lugia's damaged. Oh, Kyops is ready to go, though. And still no damage on that. So some carefully placed Pokemon for Seb could, could see the win here. But Milosov still has so much potential with the damage counters from Sebli. Mm. It just doesn't matter what's in the active. Yeah, no, definitely. So we're going to see... Likely a Lugia take a knockout here, which would put Seb down to two prizes. Uh, Milosov's just been mined, of course, so you get, you know, again, another bit of disruption where Seb has been able to do so. That Sableye is on the bench with an energy already attached, which does mean that Oranguru and something else will also take some more additional damage. 
discards the stadium from the attack as well and now has gone down to the final two prizes as just mentioned. Milosav will need to consult his hand. Uh, hand of four from the Mani will draw an extra card for five. Um, but does he need to use the comfy flower selecting to start kind of building up his combo pieces once again? Or will he just go for the Sableye initially just to kind of put himself in a bit more of a commanding position? Yeah, lots of little decisions to make, mm. I think, again. Having a very delicately constructed hand put to the bottom of the deck <laughs> is horrifying. So I hope that they managed to get something in this hand which was workable. They've gone ahead and promoted the Zerbali, so hopefully they've got something to work with. Yeah, so if he does begin to target down the Oranguru, obviously with 10 HP remaining, we'll have a further 110 um, damage counters to still drop onto, side, onto Seb's side of the board. Um, so just kind of eyeing up what the options could be here. Of course, it's only three prizes remaining, so that Luger on the bench is a bit of a target, but then Milosav will likely need another uh, Sableye to be able to continue sprinkling on or begin setting up the active as a potential option as well because then it's just taking out the active uh, Lugia V-Star instead. So, again, more decisions to make, um, but, you know, Milosav's well-versed in this kind of matchup. Despite already having to go through a grid and VMAX, um, it's now back to business as usual up against a Lugia deck, mm -hmm. I think. <laughs> I think you're very right. It's, it's, it's been a long round, this one, so far. We're really far into this game. And I still feel like both sides could have this. Mm. Yeah, definitely. We do. They're see both still playing it through. Yeah, definitely. And that's that's. I guess you know you would have been playing for so long now. You would have known how long this game was already gone. If you go to a game two, unless something goes drastically wrong, sometimes which it can happen, um, it's it's probably not always ideal. But if you still got that small percentage of a chance to win this game, sometimes you just got to grab it with both hands if it presents itself. So Seb's played those Marnies to try and disrupt where possible. Milosav has been able to um, get the Mirage Gates. Again, shuffle those good cards he might mm -hmm. have put to the bottom um, back around the deck again. We'll be drawing at least, likely at least one prize here as well, um, which might be the bottom card, which is that battle VIP pass, which isn't too useful because that one-off boss is also at the top there, um, sitting pretty at the same time. But it does yeah. have the Mirage Gate onto those Radiant Greninja waiting to use uh, Moonlight Shuriken as well. Moonlight Shuriken such a game changer in this as well because if another Sablite isn't able to be set up, again, placing those damage counters carefully so that Greninja can take KOs easily, where Seb has no way of getting any damage counters off of their Pokemon. Yeah, exactly that. So definitely a massive highlight. And I think that, does that look like a Raihan? That looks like a, might have been played there or looking to be played, but he's just figuring out um, his own strategy there, Miroslav, as well. Looks like he's just uh, applying those damage counters mm. um, there. That Guru looks like it's uh, had its damage counters removed, so it looks like it has going, or is going to be knocked out from this Lost Mine attack. And the remaining damage counters have been um, onto, or have been put onto that Lugia Vista on the bench. This could possibly be it, because if Seb doesn't take out that Sabli and the Greninja, which could be difficult with their current setup, <laughs> it, mir worst miracles have happened. So we, we could see it, but it feels unlikely. Miloslav has two prime attackers that can both take out their Lugia at this point. Yeah, and there's... And they see it. There was a scoop by, uh, there by Seb. I mean, he did also have that uh, Manaphy in hand. So Miloslav does take uh, game one of our round three for the uh, regionals in Bochum. Today, as we could just see there, it's just panned back over to Miloslav to really just kind of showcase how he's feeling. I, I, I mean, he must be massively relieved. When you're playing Lost Box in such a long game one, um, yeah, you're going to be relieved when you're able to take the dub and go into game two um, feeling pretty comfortable. Yeah, his calculations were perfection and it shows because they ended up taking the win <laughs> and there isn't loads of time left on the round. So we'll no. have to see how this goes. If they can't close another game, then Miloslav gets it. Yeah, that's it. And I mentioned it a bit before. Typically, a lot of these decks, you know, they don't go that drastically bad, mm. um, but it can happen. So we'll be looking to try and utilize any sort of weakness in Milosar's sort of uh, hands that he might be drawing into uh, where possible to try and maybe take a game two. Um, yeah. But, you know, it, it's only, I think, just over 10 minutes remaining. It can happen. Uh, but Miloslav is in such a commanding position right now. Absolutely. Um, and it looks like he may be going 3-0 soon. But 
Seb will be doing everything in his power to, to bring it back. Absolutely, and turn those tides, and it can happen. Sometimes the deck just doesn't do what you want it to do, and maybe those comfies just don't say hi. So <laughs> we'll have to see what happens. No, it definitely. It was, so, it was interesting to see um, how both players were able to just take their time on their turns. They didn't need to necessarily force any attacks during that matchup at all. Um, as we do see that Green and VMAX in the prizes uh, placed down as game two sets up. And I think Seb's just double checked and he has noticed his way of a very quick game two would be potentially setting up a Green and VMAX as soon as possible and taking those uh, two knockouts at quick succession. Mm -hmm. um, because it's not available to him anymore, it, he might just have to rely on Milosov potentially not drawing as well as he uh, potentially could, but Milosov has started that comfy in the active position. Yeah, the, the price cuts are really interesting because n neither are perfect, mm. but arguably Seps are drastically worse with the only playing two Lugia V-Star in their deck. That is one of them out of the question. Can they find the other in time before Milosov just runs away with it? Because although there's two Colress in the prize cards, the comfy star and the VIP <laughs> battle pass makes a huge difference. Yeah, definitely grabbing those, instantly grabbing those uh, Radiant Greninja and the additional comfy just to kind of give himself that board to mean it doesn't matter what you do right now. I'm in a good position. I'm also going to be drawing through my deck, um, seeing a lot of cards, getting a lot of information and then just being able to play out my own game plan against your Lugia deck. Um, of course, wouldn't know that the Greedent VMAX is um, currently sitting in the prizes. Um, so Milosov will be making sure he does this um, and works out his game plan correctly. Um, mm. Make sure he doesn't make any, any mistakes. A really unfortunate slow start from Lugia, though, with that turn. It's unfortunate to start man if he won Lugia on bench with an energy attach. It's not quite what you want to see. So seeing the Lost Fox really ramp up after that. And we know we saw from game one where Milosav played out his, uh, his turn one as well, which uh, itself took plenty of time. Um, just because there's so many decisions, there's so many things that he can do. There's the concealed cards, uh, being able to draw two, uh, two additional cards from discarding a, a, that water energy there, and now Ooh. gets to play um, his supporter for the turn as well. So um yeah lots lots of things and lots of decisions to make from Milosov's side of the board the consistency in Milosov's deck is so apparent it's just going and he knows exactly what he's after in this in this game it's it's really fantastic to see he's making very strong decisions he's not faltering really confident i feel it yeah it's, it's just such a it's such a seasoned um, like actions that he's kind of making. So he's obviously played Lost Box before and put a lot of time into the deck as well. As I mentioned, both players are very much seasoned uh, Pokemon players or TCG players. Uh, so they know what they're up against. They, I know Seb's played Lugia before with that Greedon and has uh, done well with it. Uh, Milosav here has hit another Battle VIP pass, so he's just getting his board completely set up now. Um, and just being able to just put himself in the best position possible um, to actually w in a position where he would normally maybe even win this game if it didn't potentially go to time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Seb side of the board, a lot of the times with Lugia decks, sometimes this is absolutely fine because that Lugia is not going to get knocked, uh, unlikely to get knocked out, I should mm -hmm. say. Um, and it's just a position of maybe he has a supporter in hand and then he can start kind of bursting through. Um, by getting the V-Star, by getting the Archeops down, and then start off taking knockouts where possible. The only problem is with not playing Stoutland, there's no way to kind of take an advantage in the prize trade. Um, and that Greed and VMAX, and, which is essentially his Stoutland, just not available to him uh, for this matchup or currently in this matchup anyway. No, unfortunately not. But like you say, Lukia can just explode. It can just ramp so quickly. You blink and suddenly <laughs> there's a board and loads of energy everywhere and everything's kicking off. So it's not unusual for Seb just to take it calm for a turn, knowing that Milislav doesn't have any huge attackers that are going to be able to one-hit kill that Lukia right away. It is going to take more than one attack or a knockout from Seb's side so that Milislav can come back with that revenge Zamazenta. Mm. And there's the second Confei flower selecting here as well after that scoop up net on the active. Um, again, 
I mean, how many cards has Milosav already seen from the concealed cards? Mm. Uh, the two now uh, flower selectings, the chorus experiment. There's a number of cards that he would have powered through in his deck just on his first turn as well. Um, and that's why there's so many micro decisions that needs to be made and just making sure that your board um, is as good as possible for the matchup you're against. You know, there's ideal board states in every matchup, of course. Um, and in this scenario right here, right now, there's his escape rope. Applying more damage to that Lugia um, is potentially an option as well with that Cramorant on the bench. Does go into his third Convey. Um, there as well with another flower selecting um, and Seb's just kind of staring down a, a board which is setting up um, almost to perfection for Miloslav. Yeah, looming over a Cramorant ready to attack. <laughs> it's honestly not looking too hot, but you never know what's going to happen. Miloslav still has a lot of decisions to make and interestingly, the deck is, is flowing right now, even with the lack of call rest because they might not be able to push past the four lost zone to the seven ready for Mirage Gate so easily in this one because they don't have access to as many Colrares as they would hope because they only have possibly one left in deck by the looks of yeah, it. That, that, that seems to be the case with the two prize right now. Um, but at the same time, he's, you know, he's already up to five because of those three Convey flower selectings and the one chorus is already played. Um, as you can see, they're just highlighted in the discard pile. Um, so pretty ideal. There's the attachment for turn as well, giving himself another auxiliary sort of um, Pokemon search uh, going straight onto the bench, which is a fantastic card for a deck like this where you're wanting to just pivot around, particularly as you have attackers which don't need any energy to attack. Um, so again, everything going Miloslav's way at the moment. Yeah, nice and smooth. We'll have to see how Seb retaliates. Hopefully they'll be able to kick off themselves, but we are running really low on time. Yeah, just under the three minutes remaining now. We do see that Snorlax come into, into play onto that bench with that amazing artwork there, the trainer gallery version of the Snorlax. Does deal heavy amount of damage and has pretty high HP itself. Um, using that thumping snore attack for 180 damage does have a pretty unique effect of putting itself to sleep <laughs> yeah. and requiring two flips instead of the one to wake up. But, you know, it's such a powerful attacker that we're seeing just a regular occurrence in a lot of decks now. We started to see a lot of it in Luya. We started to see a lot of it, of course, in Lost Box, being able to retaliate into things like the Stoutland with a Choice Belt. Um, as you can see there, we go into Miloslav's attack with Spit Innocently with just 110 onto the active Lugia V. Yeah, even without that, the Snorlax can do such big damage. But with the Choice Belt, it can take out most V Pokemon. So Lugia wasn't looking too hot to begin with, but Amani goes down. Miloslav's careful hand building goes to the bottom of the deck once again. Yeah, that's the Snorlax and the and the Cramorant really work well together as two hit attackers um, to take out big V stars, for example. That 110 already on the Lugia brings a the Lugia V-Star down to 170. Yeah, well within range of yep, that Snorlax. Exactly. Not perfect damage. You are wasting that extra 10 oh. damage, unfortunately. <laughs> but if you're taking two prizes for it, not too much of a problem. We don't mind a bit of, over <laughs> of uh, overdoing it a little bit. Yep. <laughs> no worries at all. There we go. We do see, was that a, a, oh, it was a read the wind with the Aurora energy. Oh. Um, didn't attach it, of course. Didn't want to discard anything further. Just drew some cards. But yeah, Seb's position here i mean i guess the writing might be on the wall a little bit unfortunately for seb um not being able to at least take any knockouts or um ko's here on miller's side of the board to at least start initiating a bit of a price race where possible uh, and it's just a uh, will be as consistent as possible uh, mm -hmm. with the read the win there's an escape rope um Milosov will just be going into i assume some conveys again so building, the man of <laughs> build, building up the, building up his hand once again to to what he wants for his combo pieces. Uh, both both the uh, Radiant Greninja already been used as well, just for our viewers, just to make sense of exactly what's going on. Milosav doing his best uh, to help us out as well as you guys at home. Yeah, we might be able to hit that Mirage Gate this turn. Manaphy's not too difficult to knock out, though. We could use other attackers, but even the Cramorant. But maybe another Escape Rope could come into play. <laughs> and oh, there it is. There it is. You are psychic, Amy. <laughs> you know exactly what's happening. Um, yep, so we're just going to be having a little look at how this game is going to continue to play out for the moment. Um, as we go into a second comfy 
uh, with flower selecting. And as you can see, the time is beginning to count down as well, but we'll get confirmation shortly of exactly the scenario. Uh, yeah, and I think that they both players have been communicated. That time has been called, and Miloslav will be taking um, round three of our Bochum regionals, um, which is, again, fantastic to see another lost box played almost to pretty much to perfection. There was yeah. nothing I really saw. Um, any, there wasn't any, any discards that were quite difficult, in all honesty. Um, so, yeah, it was fantastic to see them both um, play. Fantastic to see the Green and V Max come into play as yeah, well. Yeah, it was a really fun deck <laughs> to be able to watch today. I'm so overjoyed that we got to enjoy that together and see another Lost Zone box just run away with it. Yeah, and like I said, congratulations to Mirosav going on to a 3 0 record. Um, Seb, you know, we'll be going to 2 1, but that's still a great, fantastic position to be in um, to continue to try and push for that day two and further if possible. Um, of course, you know, Seb hoping to maybe feast on some of those confis later again with that greed and VMAX. Um, <laughs> didn't quite work out this time, but it, like I said, it, it was really fun to see both players just taking a moment to yeah. just have a bit of a standoff. Yeah, it they really did. Well. It, was, it was fascinating to watch, and I really hope that greed and does well throughout the day because it's definitely a spicier pick. Yeah, I wonder if we'll see any more Green and VMAXs um, out in the field. But um, yeah, it will be interesting to see. I'm sure we're going to try and figure out and bring some more interesting matchups for the viewers as well um, because this is only round three. We've got six more to come and plenty more of us, yeah. uh, of course. And, and of course, Shay and Ben, um, who was on uh, round two, uh, casting for you guys at the same time. But, you know, this is, I'm really excited. I'm still wanting to see, as we start to filter out exactly which players are going to be going maybe 3-0, 4-0, 5-0, and start to lock their position. Yeah. Um, I just can't wait to see what other action we're going to get on. And I seriously think, like, especially with just having seen Greedent there, mm -hmm. these decks are not as linear as we have been led to believe. Mm -hmm. We have so many different variants of every single deck here today. And I think e even just in the last three rounds, we've seen that. We've seen different things in the Lost Zone decks. Mm -hmm. We've seen different plays in the Lugias. Muse have been different, everything. And yeah. I think they're so unique to each player. And it's clear that these players have been going through the paces, testing lots, and really bringing their own to their deck list. And I love seeing when a player and their deck list kind of <laughs> synergize like that. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's one of those things as a player, you, you, you're already trying to read the meta game of what you're trying to expect. Of course, we've had some fantastic results uh, in other tournaments, um, like OCIC, which of course just happened yeah. last weekend, um, which has built into multiple tournaments that's happening this weekend as well. But each player is just bringing their a little bit of you know uniqueness to a deck we've seen tech cards come in to decks we've seen tech cards taken out do people play go for the consistency route there's so many different options available mm. um, and despite us having played this format for quite some time we're still seeing small bits of innovation which is what I really love to see uh, and just keeps it interesting for us, the casters, and the viewers at home. So Yeah, I think um, it's clear from OCIC that we have diversity right now, mm. clear diversity. The top eight had loads of different decks featuring, and they're still not stopping. We're seeing innovation after innovation, mm -hmm. even in a format where we have so many cards mm -hmm. to choose from. It's really quite amazing to see a lot of those still coming back again and again and again. Yeah, definitely. And we've still got a few more tournaments in this format as well. We'll see what other cards from Crown Zenith um, is able to make its way into um, the meta. We saw the Zamazenta, of course, a couple of times now, um, which was, again, a fantastic addition to those Lost Box and Mirage Gate types lists. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's incredible to see how else we can make this um, as fun for the tournament as possible, particularly with new cards that are coming out. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. The, um, so we can see right here, the OCIC Melbourne most successful decks. Look at that big Archeops and yeah. Lugia. 30 count, my word. But Lost Zone Box, not really that far behind it. But there are so many different variants of those two, de of those two decks that it would be interesting to see a breakdown of kind of what little decks were in each. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things where we might bring you a little bit of details later. But we know Lugia and Archeops uh, as a combo, as a duo, uh, tends to dominate a lot of the field. Mm. Um, as you see, there's a, a massive count there in comparison to the rest and in terms of some of the points that it's been able to pick up as well. But you see some really cool innovation at the same time. There's Elder Gross Control. Mm. You know, Vika Vault has been a deck which has come in and out, so it's kind of 
stopping your opponent playing with that yeah. paralyzing glaze um, and those different attacks. So his Suing Gudra is just another Lost Zone engine. Um, tanky, that <laughs> Gudra. You better be scared bulky. of it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it's it's really cool to see like a number of decks now come into play. And we've seen things like Articuno. We, it's Articuno there. It's very likely to be the Palkia uh, yeah. variant, of course. Um, so again, we've seen Palkia also dominate the field before, but again, little bits of innovation of how mm -hmm. Palkia could try and beat uh, the most played decks of recent tournaments, like the Lugia, yeah. just paralyzing it and just getting it set up for future turns. So, so much innovation, and I, I really like it at the moment. It's it's very varied, gives us a really diverse player base, diverse yeah. uh, meta game, um, despite. We will always see Lugia just kind of <laughs> a lot of a lot of it being played, but yeah. at the same time, it doesn't always win. So it's right. Um, so yeah, it's like I mean, is there anything else that you would like to see on stream at some stage? I think some of the control decks are really interesting yeah. at the moment. I'd love to see some of those come in. Whether we do see any Elder Goss control, that could be interesting. <laughs> of or even if it's just item lock. I think it's really strong in this meta. And it's interesting that that came in as a response to the dominating mm. decks. It wasn't originally there. Yeah, and no, definitely. We've seen loads of different um, players take up control lists. Of course, in, in the EU, we have access to Sander, who is a <laughs> very much... <laughs> only control uh, player. So we're just going to be looking and bringing you a quick interview as well of our round three winner um, as we just take it over to our other casters. Good afternoon, Pokemon trainers, and welcome back to our live stream of the Bochum Regional Championships. And I have a treat for you. I have the winner's interview of our last round, Milosav. How are you doing? Oh, good. I, I, I'm won. I won, so yeah. Yeah. Happy. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a, it's a great feeling. You're going into this tournament now, 3-0. So, how are you? Uh, how are you thinking about the rest of the day? How confident are you? Oh, I'm. I'm very comfortable. I'm, I'm used to playing tournaments, so yeah. No, no stress. No, yeah. no, no stranger Go, to going for the win as per usual. <laughs> no stranger to tournaments. Now yeah. we have to talk about the match specifically. We saw Seb come out with the Greedent. We saw you read the card. What were your first thoughts when you saw that? Yeah. So. Every time you, you're playing Lost Box and you, and you see a Greedent, you just have to do some magic, basically. Like, normally you're not supposed to win the matchup if everything goes yeah. accordingly, how, how, how the game is supposed to be. But thankfully for me, he had to sack a lot of energies in the start of the game, so... Yeah, I was, I, I was able to work it out somehow with uh, my gut feeling, basically. Yeah. Just, there's, like, you can't really apply like, uh, game theory to it. So, yeah. usually, <laughs> usually you see Lugia and you have an idea of what the deck might look like, but of course some players decide to play a little bit spicy. They play that Greedon, and they play that uh, the Ditto V, the Raikau, like we saw there from Seb. But let's talk about your deck. So you're playing Lost Box, you're favoring the more V-orientated deck with this yes. Sky Seal So take us through why you came to that decision. Well, that's actually quite simple. So for the past two weeks, I've only been playing TFT. And I just <laughs> messaged Pedro, like, what should I play? And he said, yeah, just, just play this. And I basically took his 60. I made one change. I, uh, like, cut one supporter card for a Sableye, I think. That's, sure. that's the difference between our lists. And yeah, that's, that's basically sure. it. <laughs> now we know, of course, that it, it it's a bit difficult to orientate sometimes with the Comfe decisions, the Coloruses. So how do you approach the, those sort of decisions? You know, what are you prioritizing in certain matchups? All right, so you always go for the, uh, for the, for the draws that give sure. you no punishment, I guess. Like, you, you go for free information. So Greninja is always the priority, unless you actually need the energy in the turn for something. So, like, for example, if you're going for a, a turn one attack with, like, a Snorlax, then you need the attachment, right? So you might save the energy. But most of the time, you, you just go Greninja first, then you go Colress first, because if you compare the Colress uh, uh, throws co to, with the Confis, right? Because co Confi throws two out of one, so it's sure. hot. So if you get, like, two good cards, it's... Uh, way worse than uh, if you get two good cards of, out of the chorus. So yeah, so yeah chor chorus is the second option, and then after you go through the Greninjas and the choruses, you go for the Confis. Sure, no, that's fantastic. Great, great explanation. So, you're, as we said, we're going into the tournament now 3 0. You're going into round four, confidence. Now, what were the rest of your matchups? What were they like? You know, we, we know that you've won twice. So, I faced strategies round one. I was able to win the first game, and the second one uh, didn't actually finish because yeah, it's, it's a one price deck matchup, so it happens from time to time. And I was quite lucky because with my deck, I don't really have any innate uh, Regi counters. So I think the only way I can beat the matchup is that I just start uh, aggroing him with Raikou, and uh, I just get in the lead. I hope he doesn't attack first and sure. try to steal the game from that point. 
and then I beat a mule. That's basically a free win because uh, yeah, I played the stone and the drapeon, so I just take four we prizes. Know, we know game. it's a good matchup. Did you were you managing to use the sky steel stone on the drapeon? Yeah. <laughs> so it's good taking yeah, more prizes, right? When the opponent flips a mule or a genesec, you you're like, oh, okay, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> good to know it's your most confident <laughs> yeah. matchup. So let's talk about you a little bit. You know, you you know, we know that you're an established player, and you know, tell us about how how you got to be the player you are. Whew. Well, I started playing back in the Diamond Emperor era, which is like 12 years ago or something, maybe even more like 15, I don't know. And then I took a huge break until Steam Siege. Uh, yeah, this is where I began, but I was still kind of like for fun player. I wasn't that good, like I wasn't in the you know in the in the higher levels. But then uh, a pretty good card got released. It's called Zora GX, yeah. and yeah, I just played a lot of Zora Qu GX, and quite good. the card actually helped me <laughs> improve a lot in this game yeah. because it, it, it forces you to do a lot of or like it forced you to do a lot of decisions, right? So sure. yeah, I, I improved tremendously by uh, uh, by playing Zora, and yeah. Yeah, from that point on, I'm just where I am. <laughs> Favoring the more micro decision type deck. Yeah, we know Zora very simple. I, I, I don't mind the, the I don't want to say the generous, but like the, the simpler decks as well, as, sure. especially if the simple deck is like a good meta call percentage wise. I don't mind sending like a, a Wikabulu or like a Palkia Jotun. Like if I think it's a, it's a good one, I, I will play it for sure. sure. So yeah, that's the priority for me, like just having a good match of spread. But <laughs> overall, it always feels better to play a deck where you get to have a bit more uh, leeway with decisions. Yeah. I guess. No, no, sure. So you spoke a little bit about Pedro and him having an influence on the, your deck choice. You know, let's go through your testing process. You know, how do you, how do you come to the decisions to play the decks you are? All right, so I guess to say it in brief, I just always want to be playing the, the best deck in the room. So sure. Yeah, that's it. No, and when chances. I'm playing the deck, I also always want to know what is the correct decision in the set matchup. Sure. No, no, it's fine. And of course, you know, we're, we're as, as we mentioned a couple of times now, you're going into this tournament. What are the matchups you want to see? You know, we know that Mew is going to be the most likely, you know, win for you. But but what are the other matchups that you feel comfortable with? I mean, honestly, anything that's not a, a Greedent deck. Sure. <laughs> like, I, I guess Greedent and Regis are like the, the big boogeyman for this deck. And some kind of overtech Lugia built with like charms and Stoutant also yeah. kind of hurts because I have no way to kill a Stoutant with charms. So okay. yeah, th those are the big three I don't really want to face. Yeah. Well, you got the green in out of the way. I mean, yeah, you came I mean, away with that with a win. <laughs> yeah. So so you know it's all it's all good on you. So you know, uh, let's talk about you know we, we, we're moving into the tournament. What? How confident are you coming into say day two? Well, I'm still not in there, so yeah. <laughs> yeah but I, I hope I can make it. But yeah, I've had a lot of tournaments where I just open three or four, and then I just run it down. So yeah, I, I just, just have to focus on winning all the time. <laughs> well, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. There's very, some very good insights into yourself, your decks, and also the format and what you think of it. But now let's go back to a little bit of a break and stay tuned because we got round four coming up, and it's live. <laughs> 